Welcome to Jurassic Park. I'm not even supposed to be here today. I'm just a fucked up girl who's looking for my own peace of mind. Welcome to the party, pal. I'll be back. I'll have what she's having. I'm gonna make him an offer again. He is looking at you, kid. You're gonna need a bigger boat. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Ho, 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 Merry Christmas, you filthy animal, swell, son of a nutcracker. It's the More Than Pixels on a Screen Christmas special. I'm your host, Jim McLean. I'm feeling particularly festive on this recording because we have something very special for you. Something a little bit different from our usual ramblings, spoilers, digressions. I know that's what you're really here for, dear listener. But what started as a joke many moons ago between myself and Adam Neeson where we came up with the idea for a Martin Scorsese, not necessarily the Martin Scorsese, who was a filmmaker turned butcher who ran a shop on Castle Street here in Belfast and was rather opinionated on all things cinema, MCU, and was very worried about the future of the film industry. Well, that has mothballed, dear listener, into what you're about to listen to. And I want to thank, first and foremost, Adam Neeson for taking the time to write the screenplay for this. I think it's fab. Then, of course, I would. And just as important, I want to thank our players. So you'll hear myself, Adam, alongside Rachel Murray, who's making her debut on the pod, local actor. She's absolutely fantastic. She does a great Greta Gerwig. We have regular Maria McQuillan, and uh, we also have Robert J.E. Simpson playing Orson Welles. And it's great to hear Robert back on this pod. We definitely need to get him back on more often. He hasn't been on for a while. I think we need to get Robert. I think, if anything, for 2024, we need to get Robert back on the More Than Pixels on a Screen pod. And, of course, you'll hear the Banderflix deputy editor, Joe McElroy, lending his vocal talents to a few roles. So it's a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy Yes, it's a bit bonkers, but it's Christmas. So sit down, pour yourself a glass of whatever you're drinking, crack open the tub of Quality Street, and enjoy the King of Castle Street holiday special. On a cold December night, the cobbles of Castle Street glimmer with a layer of black ice. The street is lit up for the holidays, beautiful as always. Shoppers shopping, buses rumbling, and a topless man is boxing a lamppost. All is right in Castle Street, apart from the booming noise coming from the local butchers, Marty's Meats. Reasonably priced chops and spicy sausages fly through the air. The owner, Marty Scorsese, is clearly upset with his staff, and Marty doesn't mince his words. What the hell are you wearing? Marty's most loyal employee, Bobby D, steps out from behind the red and white beaded curtain to reveal his brand new Aquaman t-shirt. Hey, what the hell are you shouting for? It's my new Aquaman shirt. I want it to the midnight premiere tonight. We open at 6am tomorrow morning. Christmas rush. There'll be no midnight shows for you. What will I tell my son? I need them. If he's showing me. You tell that boy to get a real hobby, like how to properly use a bacon slicer without knocking your knuckles. Why are you being such a Scrooge, huh? Can't you let people have the fun? If your idea of fun is watching a man talking to a fish, I was something to tell you. Marty takes off his butcher's apron and puts on his winter coat, his woolly hat and mittens. Man has to stay warm. He's 81, you know. You still okay to finish up? Yeah, yeah. Don't forget, 6am sharp. No superheroes. Marty slams the door with such force it rattles the ribs in the window. Bobby D sweeps the floor and looks into the air wistfully. He feels a song coming on. If only I could dream of me and you, the MC. Stop that! We don't have the budget for musical numbers. I am sorry. Exit Castle Street. As Marty walks down Castle Street, He looks upon all the faces of its most loyal residents. Danny and Brian O'Malley, two brothers always embroiled in hand-to-hand combat over who smoked their last bit of brown. Then there's Stabby Joe. The name explains itself. And of course, Shazzy Shankill, 
Marty's true queen of Castle Street. Here, Marty, are you coming to mine tonight? Don't forget to bring that bottle of book, eh? As Marty takes a step out to cross the road, a huge double-decker pulls out in front of him. Hey, for fuck's sake! Marty takes a step back onto the pavement. He looks up at the giant double-decker to see something worse than his previous dance with death just a moment ago. Plastered on the side of the bus is a huge banner for the Marvels. Marty raises his fist in anger. Damn you, you big fucking translink bastard! Marty shuffles off in anger, muttering under his breath, all the way to his front door. Marty turns the keys to the door of his house, a house built on an empire of meat, much like your mum. Marty takes one last look at his beloved street. A small child waves as he passes in a stroller, a Spider-Man stroller. Marty just shuts the door. Later that night. Mr. Scorsese enjoys his evening, sat by the fire, feet up, packet of KP salt and vinegar nuts by his side, when he hears a ghoulish sound coming from his door. Get away from the door, you dumb kids! Marty slides into his slippers and marches to the door to give the kids outside an earful. He reaches for the handle, pulls the door open, and is immediately pushed to the ground by a giant gust of wind. This is the sound of wind. Can it be? Spirits from another world fly around the living room, causing chaos. Photos of Marty and the Rolling Stones come flying off the wall. Marty's meat knives dance around the kitchen. A glass case above the mantelpiece containing Marty's beloved Oscar teeters on the edge, ready to fall to the floor. Jesus Christ, Oscar! Marty, in all the madness, dives for the mantelpiece, grabbing the Oscar seconds before it hits the floor. He looks upon the Oscar, seeing himself in the reflection of the gold, reflecting on a time he once felt love. Marty works up the courage to address the ghosts that have invaded his home. What the hell do you want? Who are you? The two ghosts float down in front of Marty. Both ghosts are being dragged down by the chains made of 35 millimeter film. Don't you recognize this, dear boy? It is I, Orson Welles, and my ghostly friend, David Lynch. Hello. But, David, you, you aren't dead. I'm coming to you through transcendental meditation. We're here with important news. Yes, it is a dire time, Marty. You have lost your way, wasting your skills with sausages and pre-made garlic baby-boiled potatoes. Those are pretty good. We need you back behind the camera, my dear boy. It's over. Meat is my game now, not movies. Superheroes have ruined everything, gentlemen. When was the last time you were offered to make a movie? I haven't made a studio movie since Dune. I've actually got a new project on my mind about a carrot that's in a rock band. But the band is actually the embodiment of evil. Lord Dern will play a table lamp. Well, maybe that was a bad example. You don't understand, Orson. If it's not men and tights, it's sequels or remakes. That's why we are here. To tell you that you will be visited by three ghosts tonight. They will help you find your way. I'm not giving up my meat shop. I'm king of Castle Street. Damn it. As the ghosts begin fading into the great yonder, Orson gives one last piece of advice. Heed our warning, Marty. The world of cinema needs you more than you know. Marty, I'll meet you next Tuesday for coffee. Okay, David. Marty, rightfully stunned by the whole situation, sits back in his chair. Could it be real? He thinks. Surely not. David, could have just called. It's easier. Marty's mind is going a million miles an hour. But this isn't the end for Mr. Scorsese. This is just the beginning. A distant yelling shakes the wooden frames of the house. Oh! Jesus Christ, my big, great, big, thick, bushy eyebrows are standing on their ends. What the fuck now? Marty! Get out here, whatever you are. Serenity now, Marty. What the hell do you want? Marty backs into the corner of the room, ready for whatever is coming for him. He feels an ice-cold grip on his shoulder. Oh, fuck. Marty turns to see the ghostly face of Jerry Stiller. Marty! Oh! Marty runs to the other side of the room in fear, 
Jerry extends his arm, showing that he is a friendly ghost. Where the hell are you going? Get out of my house, Stiller! I'm here to show you amazing things, Marty. When life was better! My life is going perfectly fine, thank you very much, sir. Pork chops, salt and chili chicken, horse shit, Marty. You belong in the pitches. I'm here to show you the good old days. It's over, Jerry. I'm through. Jerry grabs Marty by the hand. You ain't done yet! And just like that, Jerry lifts Marty off his feet and through the roof. Up and up and up they go, Oopsie. getting higher and higher over Belfast as they level out and soar over the city. Marty grabs his inhaler and takes a deep breath. You're gonna kill us! Us? I'm already dead! <laughs> Jerry beelines it towards an oncoming plane flying towards them. Jerry, for fuck's sake, look out! <laughs> Marty closes his eyes as the plane is feet away from them. Ready to accept death, Marty squeezes his eyes tight. Yet he feels nothing. Is this it? Is this the afterlife? Mm -hmm. Marty opens his eyes to see that he is not just alive, but also flying over New York City. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, Marty. What the hell are we doing here? Let me show you. Jerry dives into the hustle and bustle of New York City, dodging in between buildings, down alleys, through steam billowing from the sewers. Marty smiles as they rush through Little Italy, past his childhood home. It looked just like it did in 1975. And, well, that's because it was 1975. I'm like Huey Lewis in the news, I'm back in time. God, this looks wild familiar. Here, is that my good-looking self behind the camera there? And is that Bobby D? God, he looks so young. Yes, Marty. This is the filming of Taxi Driver. I've took you here to see your youngest self. Look how much passion you have behind the camera. You could have this all again, Marty. There's something more important we need to go do. But let me just talk to Bobby D for a second. Hey, Bobby, you talking to me? He said it. A short time later. Marty knocks on the door of an apartment that once felt familiar to him. He touches the old wooden frame around the door, smiling. He can hear a voice getting closer to the door. It sounds like shouting, but not with the tone of aggression. He knows that voice. It's the voice of his mother. Hello, how are you? Can I help you, sir? I am... Uh, um, uh... Oh, you must be Lisa's father. She told me you were coming into town. She just left her apartment. Please come in and take a seat. I'm sure she won't be long. I shouldn't. No, no, come in. Out of the cold. Come on. Charles, we have a guest. Put some pants on. Marty walks into the apartment and immediately smells the familiar scent of his mother's meatballs. Everything in the apartment was exactly as he remembered it. He looks at all the old photographs on the walls, all his old family members. Catherine rearranges the cushions on the couch. Please, mister, take a seat. I didn't get your name. It's um, um Travis. Oh, Travis. Charles, get out here and meet Travis. Did you travel far? Kinda. Catherine shuffles off to the kitchen, still talking out loud. I gotta stir the sauce, Travis. As Catherine is in the kitchen, Charles Scorsese comes out from the bedroom. He takes a look at Marty and then walks over to the armchair beside him. Hey, are you? Tra Travis, was it? Yeah, um, Travis. Uh, the boy Marty, he's, he's making a film, and uh, the character in that is called Travis. He's a filmmaker, you see, very successful. Oh, yeah? We're very proud of him. He wanted to make movies, and uh, he just went and did it. He inspires me so much. Catherine shouts in from the kitchen. Our Marty is such a good kid. I don't know where he gets the energy. Charles leans over to Marty and puts his hand on his leg. We're, we're very proud. We always will be, Marty. How did you? You think I don't know my own son when he sat in front of me? Marty smiles with a tear in his eye and puts his hand on top of his father's. The two of them share a smile. Just then, the ghost of Jerry Stiller floats through the window. Marty, it's time to go! Charles turns to see the ghost, but isn't shocked. He's actually happy to see Jerry. Jerry Stiller, I, I got your last album, Laugh When You Like. Your wife's funnier than you. 
I know. Marty takes Jerry's hand and shares one last look with his father. They look off into the air again, up far into the atmosphere. Thank you for this, Jerry. It really made me feel quite humble. Made me remember where I came from. This night they do yet, Marty. I'm just the starter. Get ready for the main course. Can I ask you a question? Of course. Anything. Why have you never hired my son? I've uh, never been one for comedy pictures. <sighs> what do you know? Jerry lets go of Marty, letting him plummet towards the earth. Marty closes his eyes tight again, saying to himself, Please wake up. Please wake up. Wake fucking up. And just like that, Marty is back, safe and sound in his humble abode, or so he thinks, as a rumbling can be heard coming from his kitchen. What now, for fuck's sake? Marty makes his way over to the kitchen to see someone raiding his fridge. Have you got anything in here that isn't meat? No, it's my fridge. Get out. The person turns around, unpeeling a cheese slice and shoving it in their mouth. This person is Greta Gerwig. Greta? Yeah, well, kinda. I'm the ghost of Christmas present. Here to show you all the good in the world, Marty. Please, no. It's been a long night. I just want to go to bed. Bed? <laughs> Not until I show you something very exciting. Are we going to fly through the roof again? No. There's a perfectly fine door right here, silly. Oh, Greta and Marty open the front door to find not Marty's beloved Castle Street, but a board meeting room. Where the hell are we? California. Or, to be more specific, Disney HQ. Why would we be? Shh! It's starting. Greta grabs Marty by the hand and pulls him under the table as the boardroom meeting begins. They all take a seat around the table, with the older-looking gentleman of the group sitting at the head of the table. This man is Bob Iger. Thank you for joining me here today. As you know, we have a bit of a crisis on our hands. The superhero business isn't very super for us anymore, so we need a quick fire way of getting back on top. Any suggestions? What about some new IP? Video games are so hot right now! So hot. FNAF, Sonic, Mario, all great successes! And what game IP do we own? Um, nothing, sir. But it doesn't mean we can't buy something. Ah, I said no spending. Give me another idea now. Reboot, sir. Legacy sequels. People love to see their old favourites. I like it. What about Hocus Pocus 2? My kids love their regional film. We did it, sir. It went straight to Disney+. Plus. What about Santa Claus 4? Tim Allen has always been a winner for us at the box office. Disney Plus! As well, sir, we actually... we made it into a TV show. Damn it! What about Willow? A reboot of Willow! Actually, funny story about that one, sir. We made it, aired it on Disney Plus for like two months, then removed it forever for no one to ever watch it again. Oh, God, please give me a good idea. What about original fog? Who the hell said that? Marty and Greta shuffle out from under the table and brush themselves off. Get me security. Wait, wait, don't you see? If you want to make money, you'll have to start making real films again. Ha, like Barbie? 1.4 billion at the box office. Shut up. She's right, Bob. Your men and tight films were never the problem. The real problem is people like you taking away the voice from the filmmaker. It's called show business, Marty. I'm in the business of making money. And we're in the business of show, Bob. Let us work, and you can reap the benefits. Not the other way round. Greta, while I have you here, would you be interested in directing a rebooted all-male version of The Golden Girls? Bob, go fuck yourself. A gang of security guards bust into the room. Time to go. Greta grabs Marty and they magically teleport back to Marty's house. I'm so sorry, Marty. <laughs> oh, that was brilliant. What was? You stood up to Iger. This gives me so much faith in the future. Filmmakers with balls. The future's in good hands, Marty. Just look around. 
So many auteurs have popped up thanks to their love of who came before them. Just like when I was a boy. Exactly. Anyway, I must pop off. Have afternoon tea with Saoirse. Thank you, Greta. No, Marty. Thank you. Greta waves as she fades away. Marty grabs a glass from the cupboard and walks over to the sink to get himself a glass of water. As he turns the water on, it begins to freeze before it can even touch the bottom of the glass. Ah, oh, Jesus Christ, here we go again. A coldness fills the air, unlike anything Marty has ever felt before. Colder than the night shoots and gangs of New York. I was pretty cold. Even colder than Bobby D's buckfast supply he had in his stag due to Lurgan. This was the cold touch of death itself. A cloaked figure rises out of the ground and towers over Marty. Which isn't hard to do. Its face shrouded in darkness. The figure lifts its bony hand and places it on Marty's shoulder. All right, then. Let's have it, then. Where are we going now? The two teleport to an empty cinema screen. One Marty is familiar with. Is this the, the QFT? Marty checks his watch and sees that it's 9 p.m. Er. Where the heck is everybody? Marty runs out into the lobby to find it also empty. Death slowly follows behind him. How, how has this happened? Everything was, was going so well. Marty runs out of the building and straight into a graveyard. It's foggy. He can barely see a thing. I can barely see a thing. As Marty bashfully runs through the graveyard, he feels pulled to one headstone in particular. As if it's calling out to him. I think this one's calling to me here. Marty slips in the mud face down. He picks himself up and wipes the mud from his face and glasses to see a giant headstone in front of him. The headstone reads, R.I.P. Cinema, 1895 to 2024. Marty can't believe his eyes. But how? Tell me, cloak figure. Tell me. The figure pulls down its cloak to reveal its face. It's Kevin Feige. Wearing a baseball cap with the Deadpool logo on it. The audience has stopped coming. You were right, Marty. But I didn't want this. You see, Marty, like it or not, cinema needs its heroes. They might be cowboys. They might be IPs. They might be musicals. People just want to be entertained. But, but how do we fix this, Kevin? We? Only you can fix this, Marty. Hi, please. Tell me. I'll do anything. You must watch all four hours of Zack Snyder's Justice League. Well, you know, like for fuck's sake, Kevin, like, uh, I think cinema might be uh, better off dead. Fine. Then pick one MCU film and we'll watch that. So on this cold and misty night, Martin Scorsese and Kevin Feige watch Iron Man projected onto the night sky. And as the credits roll... Marty contemplates about what he has just seen. Well, what did you think? You know what? I, I enjoyed that picture. Very fun. Like a, like a theme park ride. Theme park ride? Kevin raises his cloak again to become death. He grows 70 feet tall, towering over Marty in the entire graveyard. He swishes his hands and creates a tornado, lifting Marty off his feet and into the air. Death grabs Marty with his bony hand and raises him up. What the hell are you doing? Sending you home. Death throws Marty into his mouth, swallowing him whole. Marty closes his eyes one last time. I'm thinking about you, Shaza. He opens his eyes again to see he's home. He looks at the clock to see it's 5.30 a.m. My God, there's, there's still time. Marty rushes for the door, putting on his cosy hat and gloves. As he puts on his coat, he feels something in his left pocket. He knows exactly what it is by the feel. Jesus, there's something in my left pocket, but I know exactly what it is. Marty rushes out the door into the cold, icy Castle Street. He is so happy to be home that he could kiss the cobbles. I could kiss the cobbles. If he wasn't sure, he'd catch something. That's true. Marty smiles and waves at all the other local shop owners in Castle Street. Hello, William Defoe! Your vegetables look fresher than ever. Hello, Tom Hanks, you big poor express bastard. Smells like you've got a tasty cup brewing. Hot chocolate? Marty frantically knocks on Bobby D's door. Bobby's wife, Blythe Danner, opens the door. What is it, Marty? Bobby's getting ready for work. 
Tell him work doesn't matter. Bobby D comes out from the bedroom and to the front door. Molly, what the hell are you doing here? Bobby, forget about work today. We've something more important to do. Something more important than me? Is everything okay, Molly? I'm better than okay, Bobby. I find my true love again. Is Shazzy Shango back from Turkey? No, she's not back yet, Bobby. It's cinema. Cinema's my true love. From behind Bobby D comes a small voice. The voice of Tiny Tim, Mithy Chalamet. Mr Scorsese, are you taking us to see Aquaman 2? Absolutely not. I'm here to bring you the keys to the future. You, my boy, will be why cinema lives on for another hundred years. But hi, Mr Scorsese. Sicky, sicky. Marty reaches into his coat pocket and pulls out a small package. He gives it to Tiny Tim, Mithy. Open it, my boy. Tiny Tim opens the package to find Barbie and Oppenheimer on 4K Blu-ray. Wow! Thank you, Mr. Scorsese. Please, Timothy, call me Marty. Dad, can we watch them now? Please! Bobby D sees the pure joy, not just in his son's eyes, but also Marty's. He sees the same look in Marty's eyes from years ago. The luck of being truly happy again. Of course, son, but uh, maybe put Bobby on first. It's a little bit too early in the morning to be seeing Florence Pugh's jubblies. And just like that, the seed has been planted. Cinema will live forever in whatever form or fashion. May it be a small indie picture or an epic blockbuster, the art of the movies brings a voice to the voiceless. A mirror to society, a letter of love to the world, to the people that need it most. Now go forth, watch a movie, make a movie, talk about movies. Happy holidays, everybody. The end. And God bless us, everyone.